like I said, the Philadelphia Eagles knew they lacked talent and depth and athleticism at that at that DB room in the secondary in 2023, and they refused to let that be the problem in 2024. So that brings me to my primary topic today. And that is that I believe the Philadelphia Eagles secondary has real potential to be one of the best in the NFL. And the operative word is potential. Potential is unrealized talent. Potential is unrealized expectations, right? So understand the perspective I'm speaking from. I'm speaking from the perspective of the unknown, but, for, but also from the perspective of optimism, right? Understand my angle before, before you try to kill my perspective, all right? I believe this Eagles secondary has real potential to be one of the best in the NFL. Here's why I say this. You may agree. You may disagree. This is why we have a show. This is why we deliberate. This is why there's a live chat. Let's keep this thing going. The commitment that Harry Roseman has showed to rebuilding those position groups, the safety position and the cornerback position, the commitment he's shown to rebuilding those positions for the now and the future truly, truly needs to be appreciated. Really think about this. After the James Bradbury situation last year, after the season he had, and also after the amount of injuries that they sustained in 2023, Howie Roseman, he had no choice but to hedge his bet. He had no choice but to double dip into the cornerback pool in the draft. He had no choice but to look in the mirror and say, we are not good enough at the position. And quite frankly, we're not young enough. We cannot continue to rely on cornerbacks that are aging out, right? Darius Slay, he's going to be 33 this year. This could, be, this could very well be his last season in Philadelphia. The writing is definitely being written on the wall. This could be his last year. See, Flexing, you're not listening. You're not listening, Flexing. You're not listening. You're not listening. Unless you're talking about Niners all damn day. Unless you're talking about Niners all damn day. In that case, in that case, yeah, screw the Niners. <laughs> Screw the Niners and everybody that love them. But again, after the season James Bradbury had and all the injuries they had at the position, got you, Flexing, got you. My bad, my bad, Flexing, my bad, my bad, Flexing. I got you, I got you. That's my fault. I'm a little, uh, I'm a little antsy right now. I'm a little antsy right now, my guy. I'm on edge. The season is here. I'm ready to, I'm ready to rumble. I'm sorry, man. If I if I smell a if I smell a op, I'm I'm going at him. I'm sorry. My my fault. My fault. My fault, brother. <laughs> so James Bradbury had the season he had. Darius Slay, he's getting up there. And on top of that, remember, Darius Slay had that surgery on the back end of the season. Right? And throughout the season, James Bradbury was dealing with that. I mean, not James Bradbury. Uh, Darius Slade was dealing with that knee all year long. Remember, it was nagging. And then he waited until Matt Patricia took over to get that surgery. Nonetheless, Harry Roseman saw where things were trending with that Philadelphia Eagles secondary. And he doubled down on rebuilding it and reloading it. You cannot rely on a 33-year-old and a 31-year-old corner and Darius Slade and James Bradbury res respectively. You cannot rely on those guys. You have to make sure you have enough talent, enough, enough depth, and enough upside and athleticism at those positions. So I want to go through, again, we went over this earlier, right? The secondary as it is today. And obviously, Bradbury is hurt. But as of right now, this secondary, which I'm very confident in, by the way, you have Darius Slay and Isaiah Rogers on the outside. You're going to have Quinya Mitchell, who's playing the slot, but who also can play the outside. You're, you also have Keely Ringo, who can play the outside as well, who's trending up and trending up fast. You have Cooper DeGene, who can play the nickel, and who can also play a hybrid role, 
at that safety position. You have Avante Maddox, who's going to be slotted as a safety this year, but can also put the nickel. And he's not going to be playing starter reps. So therefore, his health shouldn't be a problem. And then Eli Ricks, the young developmental piece who, who plays outside corner. And then you get to your safety position, right? You have C.J. Garner-Johnson who can play the safety position and also can play the nickel spot, right? He's versatile, and he brings a ton of swag, a ton of juice, a ton of confidence and fervor to the DB room, to the defense as a whole. Then you get the Reed Blankenship, who was a tackling machine, still has to prove his weight in gold in coverage. Still, had to, still has to prove that we can trust him in coverage consistently and still has to prove that he can be healthy consistently. But Reed Blankenship at safety, playing closer to the line of scrimmage, being a box safety, he's a tackling machine. I like him there. Tristan McCollum, a prospect that I really like, who was graded very highly throughout training camp in their preseason by PFF. I think throughout the preseason, throughout the preseason, um, Tristan McCollum was graded with having a 78.4 or 78.5 rating, which is not bad for a guy who is not really supposed to be a starter. Not bad for a guy who's a developmental piece. And then, obviously, James Bradbury, safety, he's injured, going to be out six to eight weeks. So as of right now, you have 10 guys, really, that are active that can that, that you can utilize in some shape, way, or form. I like our odds. I'm sorry. I'm sorry if some people still, if some people still have their own reservations and i understand it i understand it at the end of the day like i said the operative word through my entire argument is potential potential and potential is unrealized talent potential is untapped talent potential is unrealized expectation but i think with the amount of talent you have here the amount of athleticism the draft pedigree the versatility you have i believe that they have a strong chance to be one of the one of the up and coming secondaries in the NFL, one of the secondaries that you go, that you're going to have to start to pay attention to in the NFL. And according to my man Malcolm 2.0, James Bradbury just got put on IR. Let me double check that. James Bradbury just got put on IR, if I'm not mistaken, according to my man Malcolm 2.0. Yes, it's official. James Bradbury has officially been placed on IR, which opens up a roster spot. We will see who that goes to. It's likely, it's likely, it's likely they it's likely they go to the center, Nick Gates, right? It's likely that happens. Let me read some of your comments here real quick. Davon Tyree says Niners are 0-3 in the Super Bowl in this century. That's a fact. Peter Walker says we sent the 49ers home in tears. We did, but they also smacked the hell out of us. Michael Heff says, Sills says they are a bunch of dudes. Listen, I have love for Sills, but his opinion means nothing to me. Got love for him, but his opinion means nothing to me. Everybody got an opinion. I got mine, he got his. Got love for him. Won't, won't, won't ever disparage him on the airwaves, ever. Got love for him, but his opinion means nothing to me. Sorry. Sorry. Every, everybody got a job to do. He's doing his, I'm doing mine. Got love for him. His opinion means absolutely nothing to me. Nothing. Just how there's a lot of opinions out there that means absolutely nothing to me. Fanny says, I wouldn't trust Reed to guard the sticks. He's just too slow. <laughs> yeah, man. Hopefully, hope, hopefully he uh hopefully he gets fast. He got faster, right? Hopefully he got faster. Punjab Kings fan says, Tone, I like Sidney Brown. Do you? Yes, I do. I love Sidney Brown. I love his athleticism. I love how physical he is. If he can just, if he can just, if he can just, you know, put it all together, put it all together, then I think he'll be straight. Flexing and stepping says tone on go. No, I'm not. I'm not on go. I'm just being honest. I'm just being honest. I'm not on go, bro. I'm just being, I'm just being honest. I have my opinion about this situation, and everybody else got theirs. 
I don't care about everybody else's opinion. I don't. Matt the Fly Angler says, if these edge guys can't get home, we're not even going to know what we got in the defensive backfield for real, for real. You bring up a very, very good point, Matt. You bring up a very good point, and I can't even deny that. That is an absolute fact. This defensive line, they have to dominate at the point of attack. Otherwise, we won't even know what we really got back there. That's a fact. That's a fact. All right, let me get back to my uh, – uh, let me see. Um, let me get back to my my notes here. My notes here. And again, you guys, I'm not here trying to go at nobody. I'm not here trying to disrespect nobody. It's just I don't care about other people's opinions. I don't. I don't. Sorry. What do you want? What do you want me to do? <laughs> what do you want me to do? I don't. I don't care. I don't care. Inflexing, we good, man. You good? You my guy. You my guy. Ain't about nothing, man. You my guy. It's no love loss. Even though we disagree primarily most of the time, you my guy. <laughs> just how, just how me and Sills disagree a lot but that's my guy i got love for him we disagree a lot you saw me on that show but it's my guy that's all that's all it is anyway um back to the topic at hand where are we so yeah right you know in turn the 2024 see and look i want to put it in perspective for you guys right i want to put it in perspective for y'all because I know we still have, I know the secondary still has a ton to prove. I understand it. I understand it. This, and, and I'm, I'm not going to act like it's not a fact. The fact of the matter is this secondary has a ton to prove. Regardless, regardless of how I feel about it, regardless of my expectation, regardless of my passion and my optimism, they have to prove it. They have to prove it. And I think they can. And I think they will. Simple as that. Now, I want to I want to put it in perspective for y'all. I want to I want to remind y'all just how hopeless this secondary was at one point. I want to remind y'all just how hopeless and distraught we were when it came to the secondary over the past several years. I'm going to ring off a bunch of names to you guys, right? And I want you guys to tell me how it made you feel having these men on the roster, knowing what we knew, seeing what we saw. I'm going to give you guys a bunch of names from Christmas past. And I'm going to and I'm going to ruffle some feathers and I'm going to make some of you guys uncomfortable. And I'm going to and I'm going to and I'm going to bring up some very very turbulent memories for you guys, okay? So follow me here. Stay tuned. The show only gets better. And, my, and I'm only going to make you more uncomfortable. With love, of course. With love. So, how many of you guys remember a brother by the name of Sidney Jones? Sidney Jones, a guy that we drafted in the second round that couldn't stay healthy. That couldn't, that couldn't guard a fire hydrant. How many of you guys remember Sidney Brown or I'm sorry, Sidney Jones, Sidney Jones? Yes, that man. We couldn't trust him against nobody. I don't care how fast he was. He couldn't stay healthy. And that speed was shot after he blew his knee out. Yeah, yeah, let's keep it going. How many of y'all remember Russell Douglas when we had him? Now, Russell Douglas, even though we flat out didn't know how to use him, Russell Douglas has carved out a very solid NFL career elsewhere. He had good he had he had good moments, good years with the uh with the Packers and he's had production he's had productions uh production with the with the with the, with the Bills. And he's still on their roster as well. I think the Bills traded for him midseason. So, Sidney Jones, liability. Russell Douglas, we didn't know how to use him. We didn't know how to use him. He had better production elsewhere. 
But that means nothing to me because when we had them, we got nothing. We saw flashes, but we got nothing. Let's keep it going, though. Let's keep it going. I'm about to, I'm about to break hearts. I'm about to remind y'all how bad this shit was. How many of y'all remember Cravon LeBlanc? They used to call him Strap. Who the hell was he strapping? I'm sorry. I'm who the, they used to call they used to call Cravon LeBlanc Strap. Who the hell was he strapping? Let's take it a step further. Let's take it a step further. And the thing is, Kevin LeBlanc, he would have moments. He would have moments. But he could not string it together. He was not consistent. This is me talking facts. This is not about my feelings here. This is the facts. He showed flashes. He showed moments, but he couldn't string it together. How many of y'all remember? Hold on. We get we, 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 we this getting this getting dark, y'all. This is getting dark. How many of y'all remember Craig James? How many of y'all remember Craig James, who was always on again and off of the active roster? And frankly, he was a liability most of the time. Talk to me about Craig James. Yeah, Chin. Yeah. Craig James. Exactly, Cheese. You don't want to remember him. Yes. I'm, ta I I'm taking it back. Way back. Davon Tyree. Great point. Byron, by the, Byron Maxwell, the Byron Maxwell experiment. The Namidi Asamoah experiment. Michael Jaquette. Remember that? It's getting spooky. Y'all naming names that I forgot about. I forgot about Byron Maxwell. I forgot about uh, Michael Jaquette. I forgot about those guys. Kerry Williams. Come on, man. <laughs> CZ said, Tone giving us nightmares. I just want you to understand how far we've come. How many of y'all remember Ronald Darby? Now, I will say this. I will say this. I, Ronald Darby. Ronald Darby still holds a little special place in our hearts. I know Ronald Darby holds a special place in our hearts. Ronald Darby gave us his all during that Super Bowl run, didn't he? Ronald Darby gave us his all for that Super Bowl run. He maxed out leading up to Super Bowl, leading up to Super Bowl 52. He maxed out. So I'm not going to sit here and say, Ronald Darby wasn't nice when it was nice. Ronald Darby was cool when it was cool. But when it wasn't, my God, it was awful. Ronald Darby became a liability because he couldn't stay healthy. And we know how that, we know how that ended up. Let me take it a step further. And again, I'm not going to kill Ronald Darby because we got a Super Bowl because of him. He was there. He helped tremendously. He helped elevate that secondary, him and Jalen Mills. I'm a Jalen Mills guy. I don't care what nobody's saying. I like Jalen Mills. Let's take it a step further, y'all. Let's take it a step further. Let's get real spooky. Let's get real dark. Let's tell some scary stories. You want to see a dead body? How about Josiah Scott? Yes, Josiah Scott. Remember him? Liability. Inconsistent on and off again of the roster. And let's be honest, Ronald Darby gave us one year, bro. Don't you dare act like Ronald Darby gave us a, a long, a, a lifetime of success. He came in in a Super Bowl run, and he was exactly what the doctor ordered during that run, and that was it. But Josiah Scott, liability. Punjab Kings fan with another update. Thank you, Kings fan. He says, the Eagles just signed Brett Toth to the practice squad. I saw that coming. I saw that coming. Thank you, Kings fan. Davon Tyree says, hey, Tone, remember Nolan Carroll? Oh, my God, Nolan Carroll? See, y'all taking it back. See what I did? 
I done, I done created a monster. I created a monster. Now I got y'all really thinking. Now I got y'all really going down the rabbit hole. Nolan Carroll. What the hell was that? Josiah Scott. What the hell was that? Kevon Wallace. What the hell was that? And I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to keep it real. I was high on Kevon Wallace until I wasn't. I was high on Kevon Wallace until I saw George Kittle kick his ass. Now, I will throw Kevon Wallace some bail. He never, ever could get it done in Philadelphia. He never was somebody we could trust in Philadelphia on the field. But as of right now, it seems like he's began to figure it out on the NFL level. He has become a player that the Seattle Seahawks like, and I think he's been elevated to their 53-man roster. Let me double-check that. Let me check the Seahawks uh, depth chart real quick. Let me check that. Because I think Kevon Wallace made their roster. So, yes, Kevon Wallace, he made the Seattle Seahawks roster. He's their backup strong safety. He's their backup strong safety. So Kevon Wallace is still getting NFL checks. Proud of him. Proud of him. Make that money, young man. Make that money. It didn't work out in Philly, and we couldn't trust him. Flat out. Flat out. Shout out to my man, Michael Felder, with the $10 Super Chat. He says, not only do we have talent now, but we now have the coaches in the building to teach these guys. Absolutely. Absolutely. I couldn't, I couldn't agree with you more. Now, not only, not only do we have talent, but we got the right coaching to match, Michael. Shout out to, shout out to you. Shout out to you, big dog, for showing love. Donating 20 bucks to the channel means a lot to me, bro. Means a lot to you, OG, Triple OG. Thank you. Donnell Shipley with the $5 Super Chat. Thank you. He says, Tone, I got a question. Are you worried that no team picked up any of our players off of, wa off of the waiver wire, meaning they just ain't good? Well, I don't think that's just the Eagles issue. Keep in mind, only 26 players were picked up on the waiver wire. Only 26 players were picked up. So that's not just the Philadelphia Eagles thing, my man. The waiver wire was weak this year. Only 26 players got picked up in total. Between, think about that, do the math. Between 32 NFL teams, only 26 players were picked up through waivers. That's not just the Eagles issue. So if I were you, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't stress about that, Donnell. I wouldn't stress about that in the slightest. Thank you again for donating to the channel, bro. I really do appreciate you, Donnell. It means a lot. All right, so let me get back to the notes. Let's keep this thing going. I'm not finished yet. I'm not finished reminding you how far we've come. I'm not finished. Let me let me continue to remind y'all how far we've come. Let me continue to remind y'all. Remember Anthony Harris? Anthony Harris. Remember we signed him? He couldn't run. He couldn't run at all. What else? Who else can I think about? Remember Terrell Edmonds? Terrell Edmonds, liability and coverage, could not run. Couldn't run at all. And then, and then we just moved on from Zach McPherson and Josh Job. And now we walk into a secondary. That has Darius Slay, Isaiah Rogers, Quinion Mitchell, Keely Ringo, Cooper DeGene, Avante Maddox, Eli Ricks, CJ Garner Johnson, Reed Blankenship, Tristan McCullum. And you got Sidney Brown waiting to get his shot. I'm sorry, this secondary looks a lot better than it did last year. It does. And I'm standing on that. I'm standing on that one. So forgive me. Forgive me if I'm optimistic. I'm very optimistic about the secondary. Crawley says, Tone, that's cool, but I'm worried about the D-line. I'm not worried about I'm not worried about the secondary. I feel you on that. You know, today's focus, 
Today's focus is the secondary, though, Crawley. Although I understand your perspective, I don't think your perspective is any less valid. But today, I'm just focusing on the secondary. So that's why I haven't, I haven't necessarily addressed it. But we will. We have plenty of time until opening night. We have plenty of time to address it. But I appreciate you, Crawley, for setting the tone because you're right. That D-line is something that we have to watch closely. That D-line also, like the secondary, potential, but has a lot to prove. So like I was saying, y'all, like I was saying, the Eagles secondary, based off of everything I've, based off of everything I've mentioned, based off of the past we've experienced together, the Eagles secondary has come a long way, and this is the best it's looked in a long time. The room as a whole has gotten much younger and significantly more athletic and talented. Now, like I said to you guys before, although I'm optimistic and I like this room, they got to prove it. They still have to play the game and show the world how good they are, how cohesive they are, how instinctual they are. But I think this, this room, significantly more athletic than last year, significantly more talented than last year, significantly more versatile than last year. Again, the versatility jumps off the page. You got Quayon Mitchell, who can play the outside and play the nickel. You got Kelly Ringo, right, out there, who can play outside as well. Darius Slay, Isaiah, Ro Darius Slay, Isaiah Rogers, and Kelly Ringo, and Eli Ricks are your traditional outside corners. But Quinion Mitchell can play the outside and play the nickel. You got Cooper DeGene, who can play the nickel, but also can play that hybrid safety role. You have Avante Maddox, who can play the safety and the nickel. You got CJ Garner Johnson, who can play safety and nickel. You feel what I'm saying? You got some real versatility here. And, and, and your most versatile guys are younger. The young guys are your versatile guys. You feel what I'm saying? The Eagles have some interesting matchups. So, week one. Week one, the Philadelphia Eagles face off against the Green Bay Packers. The quarterback is Jordan Love. The quarterback is Jordan Love. Their receivers are Romeo Dobbs, Jaden Reed, and Christian Watson. Those are their top receivers. Those are their top receivers. Shep with a $10 super chat. He says, what's up, Tone? What's the news? Just jumped on. So basically, Shep, what's going on is we are, we just got finished. Well, we've been discussing um, the practice squad and how it looks. We've also been discussing uh, the nature of the Eagles secondary and the upside and how good it can be. Right? We, we, we've discussed the potential of the practice squad. Uh, we've discussed the potential of the Eagles secondary. And we've also tapped into the Eagles past secondaries, right? Past players that played for the Philadelphia Eagles and just how bad they were, or let me put it to you this way. We're tr we, we basically, we basically compared the talent of this year's secondary to years past. And we're just, we were just putting it into perspective that the Philadelphia Eagles are in better shape than we think. And then now we are about, we are about to get into some key matchups that the Philadelphia Eagles secondary is going to have to face as it pertains to quarterbacks and, and receivers from week one to week eight. So we just got the week one. Week one, and thank you again for the Super Chat, Shep. Thank you so much for the $10, bro. Thank you. Week one, Jordan Love at quarterback. At receiver, they got Romeo Dobbs, Jaden Reed, and Christian Watson. Now, Romeo Dobbs, Really came really came alive in the second half of the season. Romeo Dobbs is the clear number one, and then they got Christian Watson, who's a big who, who's who's a big body receiver who has a ton of speed. They like Jaden Reed a lot. Green Bay has a solid receiving core. Like I'm not even going to sit here and talk trash. Green Bay has a solid receiving core. Romeo Dobbs came alive last year, and and, and also keep keep this in mind, right? Their whole receiving core is second and third year players. They're all super young. Last year, that receiving core was last year, that receiving core was a bunch of rookies and second-year players. 
that receiver core is pretty solid. Now, obviously, the Eagles receiver core is better. Top, it's, it's no comparison. But you got to respect their receiving core. They're fast. They're really, really good route runners. And Jordan Love trusts them. But here's the thing, though. When the playoffs started, Jordan Love really relied heavily on Romeo Dobbs. Jaden Reed and Christian Watson kind of became nine factors in the playoffs. Romeo Dobbs primarily had most of the targets. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, uh, Romeo Dobbs, let me make sure I got this right here. R Romeo Dobbs in the playoffs last year, he went off. He had 10 catches on 12 targets, 234 yards, and one touchdown through two games, right? And, you know, their tight end, Luke Musgrave, started to come alive as well. He had six catches on seven targets. He had a touchdown in the playoffs. Um, Bo Melton had a touchdown. D uh, Detavion Wicks, Tucker Craft had a touchdown. But guys like Jaden Reed and Christian Watson, they they were nine factors in the playoffs. So those still those those two guys are still, you know, elevating their game. But Romeo Dobbs, that's the that's that's the main guy. I feel like if you shut down Romeo Dobbs and make those other guys beat you, you you should win that game. You should win that game. So, uh, moving on. Moving on, right? Oh, let me get to this. Uh, let me see this. Nina Austin just joining the stream. What's going on, Nina? So, today we discussed the practice squad and what that looks like. We also discussed uh, the secondary and how good they can be. We also discussed the Eagles' past secondaries from years past and how we've transitioned so well from those guys. And now we're discussing key matchups through the first eight weeks of the season as it pertains to our secondary versus opposing quarterbacks and wide receivers. We just went through week one with Green Bay. Week one, you have Jordan Love, who's who's getting better. Let's, let's, not, let's not ignore that. Jordan Love is getting better. But me personally, I'm not totally, I'm not totally on the Jordan Love train just yet. I'm not totally on that train. He gave you a he gave you a, 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 a solid nine game stretch, carried it over to the playoffs, destroyed the pack. I mean, destroyed the Cowboys, almost made it to the NFC championship to beat the to beat the 49ers, almost did it. So Jordan Love has come a long way and the Eagles are going to have to pay attention to him. And Romeo Dobbs, same thing. He's come a long way. Guys like Jaden Reed and Christian Watson. Those are guys you got to pay attention to as well. But I think if you shut down Romeo Dobbs and force Jaden Reed and Christian Watson to beat you. The Eagles should be in good shape. Now, going on to week two. Week two, the Philadelphia Eagles face off against the Atlanta Falcons. This is interesting. This is going to be interesting here. Week two, Atlanta Falcons. The Falcons signed Kirk Cousins in the offseason. They have Drake London, who's entering year three, I believe. They got Kyle Pitts, who's entering... Uh, as a matter of fact, if I'm not mistaken, I think Drake London is entering year four. I could be wrong, though. Maybe year – I don't know. But regardless, they got Drake London, Kyle Pitts, Darnell Mooney, who they just signed. They gave a ton of money to. And they also have B. John Robinson, that running back, who is used a lot in the running game. I mean, in, in the passing game. In the passing game. Atlanta's defense just got supercharged. You're right. But I'm just focusing on their receivers right now, infamous. I'm just focusing on, on their receivers. And also the Packers got Josh Jacobs. That's somebody that that's somebody that we got to pay attention to. But I don't think I don't think Josh Jacobs is the threat in the passing game that B. John Robinson is. You tell me if you feel differently, though. But Josh Jacobs, he's more of a north-south guy, in my opinion. Um, great, great running back, by the way. But I don't think he's the threat in the passing game that B. John Robinson is. Tell me what y'all thoughts are about that. But the Falcons, they got B. John Robinson in the passing game. Um, Drake London, Kyle Pitts, Darnell Mooney, who they just signed. Now, Darnell Mooney, he's not coming off of his greatest run. He had that 1,000-yard season in year two, but he hasn't really been the same receiver since then. We'll see what Darnell Mooney, we'll see what Darnell Mooney can provide them. But Drake London is a year, is a year better. Kyle Pitts is a year better. They got better quarterback play now. B. John Robinson is a year better. 
he had over 12 or 1300 yards from scrimmage last year. He had over 400 yards or like damn near 400 yards in the, uh, in the passing game. So you got to worry about that, right? You got to worry about Kyle Pitts. Like infamous said, if Kyle Pitts is the X factor, they need Kyle Pitts to be a threat. So far these past couple of years, Kyle Pitts has not really been the player we thought he would be. Good player, talented, but he hasn't been the player we thought. But B. John Robinson is a threat in the passing game, and we got to watch him. So he's going to give our safeties and our linebackers a long day if they don't do their jobs. If they don't do their jobs. My man Shep with a $10 super chat. He says we'll definitely find out tomorrow night for sure, but I think we'll be good. Well, it's next week. Next week. It's next Friday, Shep. Next Friday. Not tomorrow, not tomorrow, but next Friday. He says, we'll definitely find out next Friday for sure, but I think we'll be good. We're a better ball team than we were last year. I agree 100%. I think we are better. We just got to prove it. We just got to prove it. All right. And Kirk Cousins, um, we've beaten him before on more than one occasion. But here's the thing about Kirk Cousins. He can play the quarterback position. I know Kirk Cousins has a bad rap, but he knows what he's doing back there. Kirk Cousins can beat you. He can. And Kirk Cousins is not slick. Kirk Cousins is playing for his second, was playing for his second franchise that plays in the dome. He's not slick. Kirk Cousins at that point in his career where he want to play in the dome for the rest of his career. He played in the dome in Minnesota and now he's playing in a dome in Atlanta. So, you know, but regardless, though, Kirk Cousins. He can play the position, and Kirk Cousins can definitely beat you. So don't think Kirk Cousins is just going to lay down. But I am curious to see what kind of player he will be coming off of that ACL injury. I'm very curious to know how what his mobility will be like. If the Philadelphia Eagles can hit him a few times, I think he'll get nervous. I think if the Philadelphia Eagles can put some – I think if they can put hands and feet, Wait, we playing them. Wait, hold on. Wait, 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 wait. We playing Kurt on Sunday night. We playing Kurt on Monday night. It's a wrap. Sorry, y'all. It's a wrap. Infamous said, luckily, y'all playing cousins on Monday night. <laughs> yeah, we are. Well, we should beat them then. But again, Kurt Cousins, new team, um, new mentality about them, new weapons. Kurt Cousins can beat you if you if 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 he catch you slipping. So we'll see how it goes down. We'll see. And remember, he beat the Niners on, what was it, Monday night? I think the, the Vikings beat the Niners on Monday night last year. So maybe he's more confident on Monday nights now. We'll see. And then let's get to the Saints. Let's get to the Saints. Atlanta's offensive line is pretty good. They're better. Let, let's get to the Saints in week three. Week three, the Eagles face off against the Saints. And their quarterback is Derek Carr. Their receivers are Chris Olave, who's their clear number one. They also have Rashid Shahid, who's got us before. And they have Alvin Kamara at running back, who is used a lot in the passing game. They also got Taysom Hill at tight end, who's a utility guy. So although I think the Saints are food and I don't fear the Saints at all, Chris Olave is the real deal. Chris Olave is the real deal. He's a, he's a, he's a legit number one receiver, right? He would be a number two in Philadelphia. He, he would probably be a number three in Philadelphia, though, because I think Devontae Smith is better than him. But Chris Olave is a number one in, in New Orleans. Rashid Shahid, he would probably be he, he, Rashid Shahid would be like a number three um, on most teams, but he's a number two in New Orleans. He has a ton of speed. So don't think he won't beat you over the top. And then Alba Kamara, he's a he's a dynamic running back that's super talented, can be used in the passing game. You got to watch him. So I think the field, so again, the linebackers, those first, those first three weeks, the Philadelphia Eagles defensive line and linebackers, they're going to be tested. They're going to be tested. Those first few weeks, the Eagles linebackers and D-line are going to be tested. You got Josh Jacobs in week one, you got Bijan Robinson in week two, and you got Alvin Kamara in week three. That's not going to be an easy feat. If those running backs get off, it's a wrap. So 
let's transition to week four. Week four, you have Baker Mayfield at quarterback who beat us in the playoffs. Granted, we beat them, so we split last year. We beat the we beat the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, I think, in week three or week four last year, and then they beat us in the playoffs. They have Mike Evans, who comes back on a new deal. They have Chris Godwin, who's a perennial, who's a perennial thousand yard receiver. And then they have Cade Otten at tight end, who's solid, not dynamic, not great, but solid. So that's going to be tough sledding for a newer, a younger secondary. But you have a guy in CJ Garner Johnson who's very familiar with Mike Evans. You know, you have a guy in Darius Slay who's very familiar with Mike Evans. You have experience scattered around with guys who are experienced with that team, especially CJ, CJ, GJ. He spent a lot of time in, in the NFC South. And he's, he's played Mike Evans and Chris Godwin a lot. You know, K to Iron, again, he's solid. Don't sleep on K to Iron. He can get open. So the linebackers and the safeties are going to have their hands full still. But Mike Evans, Chris Godwin, both of those guys, top-tier talent at the receiver position. Got to watch those guys. And Chris Godwin can be used all over the field. Mike Evans more so was an outside receiver. For Chris Godwin, he could play in the slot. He could, he could play everywhere. Now, week five, it's a bye week. The Eagles don't play. The Eagles don't play. But week six, you have Deshaun Watson at quarterback, right? And also, going back to week four real quick with Baker Mayfield, if the Eagles get pressure on them, that's a win. All you got to do is get pressure on them, and you're good. Now, Deshaun Watson, week six, the Browns, Cleveland Browns, right? Deshaun Watson. That's a home game for us. Amari Cooper, who's their clear-cut number one. And then they brought in Jerry Judy. They got Elijah Moore at the wide receiver position. And they also have David Njoku, a, a, a top tight end in this league. David Njoku is a, type 10, is a top 10 tight end. He's very, very good, very dangerous. You got to keep your eye on him. The linebackers and the safeties are going to have their hands full with David Njoku, right? Now, here's the question. Here's the question. What will Deshaun Watson be like in week six? What will his health be like? Because as of right now, he is robbing the Browns. Blind. Granted, they did restructure his contract today, but how much really like he's still killing them. He is destroying their cap. His entire contract is guaranteed. Because of how he's, because of how he's played and because of his health and how things have gone, you will never see a contract like that ever again. Fanny says the Browns' defense is tough. Absolutely. But again, I'm talking about their offense right now. Deshaun Watson, Amari Cooper, Jerry Judy, David Njoku, Elijah Moore. I don't, I don't trust Jerry Judy at all. I don't think Jerry Judy is that good. And then Elijah Moore, he's looking to turn the page from, from his career with the Jets. So, and, and Elijah Moore is a very good route runner. Very good route runner. And Njoku, hell of a tight end. So the Eagles are going to have to, you know, they're going to have to make sure they bring their bring their A game against Amari Cooper and David Njoku. Even I think Elijah, I think Elijah Moore is better than Jerry Judy. Me personally, I think Elijah Moore is better than Jerry Judy. Now we get to Week Seven. Week Seven, you have Week Seven, you have a day off. You face off against the New York Giants. You face off against Daniel Jones and rookie wide receiver Malik Neighbors. Other than, other than Malik Neighbors, the Giants have no weapons. They have nobody out there that you can trust, nobody out there that's, that, that's going to threaten you in the slightest. I'm sorry. I'm just not threatened by the Giants in any shape, way, or form. I think Daniel Jones is buns. He is not a good quarterback at all. And I don't know why the Giants are wasting their time with this man, and they should have never paid him. They should have never paid that man. Nonetheless, they did what they did. And now they have Malik Neighbors at wide receiver. I'm not worried about Malik. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I know Malik Neighbors is a good player, especially he was a good player in, at college at LSU. But I'm not worried about Malik Neighbors with Daniel Jones being a quarterback. I'm not. As a matter of fact, if the Eagles are that worried about Malik Neighbors, you bracket that man and force everybody else to beat you. 
I'm not worried. I'm not. I, I'm sorry. I can't worry about Malik Neighbors when Daniel Jones is the quarterback. I can't. Can't at all. And then we get to week eight, right? And week eight might just be your toughest opponent in terms of quarterback and wide receiver play. In week eight, the Philadelphia Eagles face off against another AFC North opponent, the Cincinnati Bengals. Their quarterback, Joe Burrow, has Jamar Chase. They also have T. Higgins. Both of those players are looking for money, by the way. So there's still some turbulence going on. By the way, Joe Burrow is coming back from an injury. We'll see where he is, right? And then you got Mike Gusecki, the tight end they brought in. Mike Gusecki took advantage of us last year. Remember, remember Mike Gusecki played for the Patriots last year. In week one, Mike Gusecki was getting, getting with us. And our linebackers couldn't do nothing about it. Our safeties couldn't do nothing about it last year. So hopefully it's a different narrative. I think I think they improve at tight end from last year. Again, where is Joe Burrow right now in his in his recovery? And I'm gonna be honest with y'all. How do y'all feel about Joe Burrow's hair? How do y'all feel about it? Be honest. How do y'all feel about Joe Burrow's hair? I know it's I, I know it, I know it's nothing football related, and I know and I know it doesn't I know it shouldn't mean much. But I don't know, man. Something about something about that hairdo, something about him dyeing his hair like that, something about it, something about it makes me makes me nervous about him. I don't know. I don't know. Again, I'm I'm reaching. It's just it, it, it's just hair. But something about it, something about it just makes me makes me question just. I don't know. I don't know. Something about it makes me question that where that team is going. Something about it. You know, leave the like leave the hair dye for the receivers. Leave the hair dye for the receivers and the tight ends and all those other guys. <laughs> Yo, infamous says minus one hundred thousand aura. <laughs> oh man, that's funny. Um, Donald Rohn says, where is his head at? I don't, that's what I'm saying. Yo, he do the like, that's, he do like Ellen. That's funny. One of y'all said he looked like Homelander. That is hilarious. Chin says he, he out here looking like Homelander. That is funny, bro. If y'all don't know who Homelander is, Homelander is from the boys. Great show, by the way. you looking for Sasuke says he looks zesty. <laughs> Fanny. Fanny Eagles fan says he went from home alone to Slim Shady. That's funny, yo. <laughs> Dang Bergang said he's Dang Bergang said he's Joe Cool. He can do whatever he wants. I don't, I don't know, man. I don't know. I don't know. You're right. He can do whatever he wants, but something about it, something about it makes me nervous for their season. I could be, I could be totally off. I could be reaching. But nonetheless, Joe Burrow, Jamar Chase, T. Higgins, Mike Gusecki, Darius Slay, Quinion Mitchell, you know, Isaiah Rogers, all those boys, CJ GJ. It's gonna be a it's gonna be a hell of a game. It's gonna be a, it's gonna be a hell of a matchup. But again, what I love about the way what I love about CJ GJ is that he's not gonna let any of those guys go into that game and question whether or not they can run with those guys. That's what I love about bringing CJ GJ back. He's going to instill so much confidence in that secondary. He's going to make guys like Reed Blankenship and, and you know, Quinion Mitchell and Cooper DeGene, especially the young guys, right? He's going to make all those young guys believe that they can run with anybody. That's what I love about the CJ GJ effect. He makes everybody believe. So we'll see how it turns out. We'll see how this thing goes. And that's pretty much our show, you guys.